Praise the Lord. This is Sean Randall with PastorSean.org back for another Bible study and another teaching. Today I'm actually going to do something a little different and it's called a pray teach, which means that we're going to have quite a bit of our time today where we pray and we teach and then we come back and pray and we teach because the subject that I'm going to teach today has to do with freedom. It's called Steps to Be Free and Stay Free. Now, before I get into this dissertation about how many steps it takes, honestly, I really don't know the answer to that. But I'm going to share with you five specific things or things that will lead you along with the Holy Ghost to help you walk out in a greater area of freedom in your life. I'm excited because this teaching has been taught several times and every time I teach it, it just changes and it takes on a different direction. The Holy Spirit adds new information to it, so we're thrilled because we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to guide and lead, and I know that the Holy Spirit is interested in meeting you exactly where you are. So let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that every mind and heart will be alert today that they'll hear exactly what the Holy Spirit has for them. Father, it is your will that we walk in truth. So over the next few minutes, I ask that every person that is struggling through strongholds or bondages and things that they're beleaguered with will be broken off because of the truth of your word. Father, we give no place to demonic forces and the thoughts and the attitudes and situations that would cause us to sway our thinking on the subject matter. So Lord, we cast down any pride and self-deception so that the word may fall on the good ground of our heart. I ask that in Jesus' name, amen. So thank you for praying in with me. So we're gonna pray teach. I like pray teach because it means that you actually get to participate and which means you're gonna walk out um, a greater level of freedom today. So go to, turn to your Bible, go grab your Bibles as always, this is a a Bible study and you need your Bible so go and open your Bibles to John chapter 8 verse 36 John chapter 8 verse 36 this is a very familiar passage of scripture and I'll read it and it says so if the Son makes you free you will be free indeed in fact I want you to repeat that with me so if the Son makes you free you will be free indeed one more time, but put your name in there. If the Son makes me free, I will be free indeed. The first thing in terms of getting free and staying free, we're talking, and I'm talking to Christians that perhaps there's some areas of your life that you're not making progress. And I understand when we say progress, it's not as if we're working, it's just progress in terms of you want to grow or there's things that you keep circling the block on and you're not making the progress you want spiritually, we have to look at root causes. And so to do that, we've got to make, some, make the decisions and admit to order, uh, admit to ourselves that there are certain areas in our lives that we're not free in. So here's a little bit of a self-test and I want you to take this for, for, for yourself. And it'll help you to know if you need any level of freedom in your life. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, and now abide faith, hope, charity, and the greatest of these things are love. Now when you think about your life in such categories as your relationships, your finances, your job, your health, your mind, your ministry, and any other area of your life, and if you have no faith, that the situation will get better, if you have no hope that things will change, or you do not love a situation in your life, you have a strong hope. Don't be alarmed, most people do. The question is, will you co-labor with God when he reveals to you what the stronghold is so that you can get free? The beauty of God and his love and, and all that he's providing in his word is that it's individualistic. You know, the Lord will never force upon us anything. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. So that's a good question. So I pray right now, Father in Jesus' name, that my friends, my brothers and sisters on the other end of this camera will be willing to co-labor with you 
to walk out a greater level of freedom in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. We're already pray teaching. The truth is, a lot of believers really don't want to take the time to look in the spiritual mirror. I was thinking about the story of David and, and Nathan right after David had committed murder and then committed adultery with Bathsheba. He was confronted by Nathan the prophet. And for all things that you can say in and about David's life as we read in the scripture, the one thing that I will say about David is that he was absolutely honest about his problems, his bondages, his situation, and his sin to the point where he would bear everything in his heart so that he can walk and be free. Now I heard someone say, you can pick your sin, but you can't pick your consequences. And that's a whole other teaching, sin and consequence. David selected his sin or participated in sin, yet the consequence was he and Bathsheba losing that child. So understand that even though we have situations and we sin, there's a consequence to that. But God is interested in helping us to walk free and get rid of all the root causes of that. Turn to your Bibles to the book of James, chapter 1, verse 23. James, chapter 1, verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. Many times we actually don't have the correct image of ourselves, and it's because we have bondages, and it's because we don't want to confront the hurts, and that's what this teaching is all about. Now, here's a revelation. Salvation is a free gift of God, and I pray that you know that. Thank you, Jesus. Freedom is not free. There's a cost. I say often that so much of what we're taught in church is not necessarily incorrect, but it is incomplete. So in a few minutes, I'm going to back that up. So kind of put a push pin there, and we'll come back to that statement that salvation is a free gift to God, but freedom is not. So class, step one, how do you get free and stay free? The first step is this. Recognize that there is a curse. Now today I'm going to disrupt someone's reality. And we need our reality disrupted. Because as Christians we, we, we suffer from forgetfulness. We suffer from the enemy attacking us. And we don't really understand that we are really wrestling against, you know, you know, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against a demonic spiritual power. And so we need our reality disrupted. Because if we don't disrupt our reality, then we'll walk around and we'll feel like everything is perfectly fine. There are believers that will be, go to heaven and enjoy all that God has for them, and yet will live here on the earth and will be bound from day to day, week to week, year to year, because they weren't willing to have their reality disrupted. Now, <clears throat> there are millions of believers that have risen from death to life, but they're not free. Now, I don't know about you, but the day that I got born again, all my problems, my sin issues, they just didn't go away. You know, when I was born again, I was born again. I went from death to life. The Holy Spirit regenerated my spirit and gave me a new spirit. My, my spirit was dead, and the Holy Spirit regenerated the spirit. He didn't take me from bondage to freedom. And here's how I know that, and here's the word, what the Word of God says on it. Go to the book of John, chapter 11, verse 40 through 44, and we'll look at the testimony of Lazarus. When the Holy Spirit had me go over this again, it was clear, very clear, that this is a two-part process in terms of getting free. Jesus sets us free. Jesus takes us from death to life. But then there's another part that so often we, we skip over, and we're going we're gonna to pull that out, and the Lord's going to share it with you the revelation on that. So, John 11, verse 40 through 44, I'll read. It says, Look at the testimony of Lazarus. This is Jesus talking. Jesus said unto her, and Jesus is saying to us today, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest not see the glory of God? Then he, then they took away the stone that was placed where Lazarus was laid. 
And Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Now, he went on to say, I know you always hear me. Here's Jesus being very deliberate because he said that so that the people that were around and watching would know that he had a direct relationship with God and that he was from the Father. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe. Even at this moment of a miracle, Jesus is working and contending with the heart and contending with one thing. I want you to believe. Jesus used miracles as a platform to build faith. And here we see it again. Verse 43. And when thus he spoke and he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And when, and excuse me, and he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with great cloths, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus said, now this is Jesus talking, get this. Jesus said to them, loose him, let him go. Jesus told the disciples to loose him and let him go. And that's exactly what this teaching is about. Jesus did his part, but we have to do our part. Jesus did the raising of the dead. He actually modeled the, the Christian experience of what it means to be born again in Lazarus. Lazarus was dead, and he raised him physically from the dead back to life. And then he gave the disciples the instruction, now you lose the grave clothes. You take off the cloth. You lose his hands, and you lose his feet. And as believers and disciples, that's part of our job is to be a part of freedom ministry and help people to get free. Now, just because you're saved, it does not mean that you're automatically free. Freedom is a choice and it can only be achieved through the truth of God's word. So I think I kind of made my point there. Now, here's another part that you need to know about getting free. There are such things as generational curses. And, um, you know, in certain cultures, Eastern cultures, they understand the word curse um, in a much more real way than we do here in the Western culture. But here's, here's a situation, here's a way to think about curses. And let's bring this home and make it simple. No one grows up saying that they want to be an alcoholic. No one actually gets married to get divorced. No one wants to grow up and beat their wives or beat their kids. No one wants to be strung out on drugs. No one wants to have ungodly behavior. No one who's suffering from an addiction actually wants to suffer from the addiction. I haven't met anybody who has suffered from a sin problem or an addiction that actually wants to stay that way. Because that's not the problem. What we see are symptoms you know, that bad behavior is symptoms. A drinking problem is a symptom. A, uh, divorce, that is a symptom. Uh, anger and rage, those are symptoms, not the root. Now, I was recently recovering from bronchitis. Thank you, Father God, for healing me. I hadn't been sick, thank you, Jesus, in probably five years. And... I went to the doctor. I said, Lord, I had prayed. I, had, I laid hands on my body so much, I started to bruise myself. I prayed and I prayed. And I said, Lord, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm never sick. So me and all my infinite wisdom decided, perhaps I should go to the doctor. And I did. I went to the doctor. And of course, he asked me a thousand questions. He told me to stick up my tongue and say, ah, and I did. And he asked me about how I was feeling. And it was pretty interesting. He asked me how I was feeling. He opened, told me to open up my mouth and say, ah. And I gave him the symptoms. He took a swab to the back of my throat and in about 15 minutes came back and told me, you have bronchitis. And I have a solution for that. The interesting thing about that whole exchange at the doctor was the doctor found out the root cause by taking a few extra steps. Then also find out from the Holy Spirit how he even ended up sick in the first place. And, and this is not so fun, and this is so true. Tired, working too much, not resting, just simply running my body into the ground, 
led to the weak immune system, which led to bronchitis, which led me to the doctor, which leads me to being healed by using medication. And I am for doctors and I am for medication in the name of Jesus. So the example here is no one wants to have these curses on them. They're simply root causes. Uh, they're simply the symptom, not the root cause. Now, the roots are what you call a generational curse, and all generational curses can be broken. All of them. All means all. The name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus is more powerful than any situation, any circumstance, any generational curse, no matter if it's drugs, no matter if it's witchcraft, no matter if it's homosexuality. It doesn't matter. The blood of Jesus is able to break cleanse and deliver us from all unrighteousness and from the iniquity. Now, we all are very quite well acquainted with what, iniqu uh, what sin is. I mean, sin is things, sin is, I mean, we do sin. Sin is what we do. Iniquity is what has been done to us that is often passed down. And the Bible calls it sins of the Father. You know, I've heard, in fact, I've heard Pastor Joel say on a couple of occasions that the blessings that he carries are because of the mantle or because of what was passed down from his father, Pastor uh, John Osteen and uh, Dodie Osteen. Similarly, if a person can pass down uh, an inheritance or a mantle or blessing, if a father abandons his wife, his children, nine times out of ten, specifically with the children, they're going to suffer abandonment issues. They're going to suffer rejection. Now, on the surface, we see financial lack. We see poverty. We see, uh, obviously, the, the lack of love that's being displayed. But at the root cause for those children that have suffered abandonment, they, that, that have suffered the loss of the leaving of a father, not to pick on fathers, but to make this real, those children suffer from abandonment issues and rejection. And so they spend their lives trying to fill that void. And what you don't fill with God and what you don't fill with the Holy Spirit will be filled with a negative presence. The enemy makes and wastes no time with filling the vacuums of our hearts with corruption. Now, the sins of the Father are passed on from the third and fourth generation according to Deuteronomy 5, 9. But the good news is this. Everybody say good news. Good news. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says... And it reads, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God and faithful, the faithful God which keepeth covenant and mercy to them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Just know that generational curses are real and that they can be broken in the name of Jesus no matter what it is. If it's rage, if it's adultery, if it's homosexuality, divorce, sexual addiction, witchcraft, all of that is too easy when someone has a repentant heart. Because there are people that suffer from sin and bondages and curses, but they won't repent. And I know repentance in the church seems like it's a dirty word, but it is the starting point to freedom. So brothers, I'm going to pray right now and ask God to show you what it is that you need to repent of. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak, Lord, in the atmosphere and ask that the Holy Spirit would convict my brothers and sisters of unrepentant sin. Father, when we confess our sins, it's not when you found out about it. So, Lord, help us to come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and grace that we need to receive forgiveness and cleansing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for revealing to my brothers and sisters the areas of their lives that they will surrender to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying that. That's not easy to do. Now, the second step to getting free is to break a curse. Being born again and to seek his righteousness according to Matthew 6, 33. You know, you know, breaking the curse, any curse is always done through the blood of Jesus by claiming and pleading the blood of Jesus. 
Now, here's another thing that you need to know about getting free is we talked about knowing that there is a curse, breaking the curse, but also reverse the curse. If all Jesus did was to die for us on the cross and pay the price for our sins so we could make heaven our home for eternity, then when we got saved, why did he just take us home? And that that's a thought that really needs some meditation. If all that Jesus did when he died on the cross for our sins was to take us to heaven, then, as I said a few seconds ago, why don't he just take us home? Why don't he just take us to heaven? Sounds like that our eternal well-being was not just the only thing that Jesus died for. Jesus died according to 1 John 3 and 8 to destroy the works of the devil and to remove the curse of sin and the curse that was on the earth and on men. Jesus became the curse for us. Is it Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So we're going to do this left and right hand confession here. Again, you get to participate. We're pray teaching today. Jesus became a curse. Take your left hand and say, Jesus became the curse. And on your right hand, so that I may walk into the blessing. Jesus was condemned so that I might be made innocent and free. Jesus was made a curse so that I might be free. Jesus was condemned that I might be innocent. That's what Jesus did for us. There was a divine exchange. And beloved, we got the best end of that deal. Thank you, Jesus. So we need to reverse the curse. We reverse the curse by understanding that Jesus did that. There's nothing that we need to do except get into alignment and get into agreement and get our minds renewed about that. Now, there are three things that we can use to reverse a curse and live a victorious life. One is recognize the enemy, know his strategies, which seems to be a little bit of a weakness for Christians because we get saved and we actually never take enough time to study our enemy. And sometimes I've talked to Christians about studying their enemy and they feel like it's almost bad theology to actually study about the enemy, which is deception, which means the enemy probably don't want you to study about them. And it's important that we know who our enemy is because Satan and all of his cohorts are very good at lying. You know, when we believe their lies, it actually empowers them to act against us and they get to work against us they get us to work against ourselves by the words we speak. By the words we speak that are verbal and by the words we speak that are non-verbal. Now I've learned this in my experience as much. There's always some voice talking. There's at least three voices talking at any given any moment of the day. Of the day. There's the voice of the Holy Spirit, then there's my voice, and then there's the demonic voice. The Holy Spirit's voice is the most positive voice that you're ever going to hear because he edifies, he exhorts, he comforts, he talks about Jesus, and he reminds us what Jesus said, and he ushers us into the throne room so that we may receive all the benefits of salvation according to Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of our sins and iniquity, who redeems our life from destruction. The Holy Spirit ushers that. He executes to make sure that we know the provision and know what the benefits are and he wants us to actually participate and activate those benefits. And then of course you have our voice. Now this is, I call it the swing man. The swing man on any given day, he can side with righteousness or that voice can side with unrighteousness. And we can talk a lot about renewing the mind and being able to hear the voice of God, which is another lesson. But when we hear the Holy Spirit's voice, immediately we're to say yes and not start asking questions and be obedient. The other thing that we need to reverse the curse, very important and not done enough, is to forgive people who have hurt you. That is probably one of the single most important 
issues or anchor that keeps people in bondage is unforgiveness. You know, Matthew 6, 12 says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our de debtors. Besides, the person that sinned against you um, was motivated by hurt. I heard someone tell me one time, you need to give people the benefit of the doubt because you don't know where they're coming from. You don't know what has happened a year ago, two years ago, 10 years ago that led them to that type of behavior. It's kind of like when two couples get married. You get a man here, let's say he's 30 years old. You get a woman here, let's say she's 25 or so. So they, for example, let's say they were courting for three years. But outside of those three years, from age 27 to zero for the man, that woman really has no idea what lit on that man, what happened to him. He doesn't have a complete video teaching or a CD set on every event, positive and negative, that has framed his or her mind or thinking and theology. And the same would go for a woman. So when you have believers and they have negative behavior or family members or loved ones for that matter, not just believers, you don't know where they're coming from. You, we simply don't know what has transpired that caused them and brought them to that negative behavior. And I believe this is so much what Jesus was teaching. I mean, he talked about forgiveness a lot. And of course, if he had written everything that he ever said about forgiveness, the Bible would be too big and couldn't contain it. But I'm pretty sure that was probably one of those conversations that they had a fireside. Besides, the person that was motivated by hurts, they are not your enemy, Satan is. We have a very real enemy, and he would kill you with a cotton ball. The enemy is so maniacal, he is good at dividing and conquering, and he uses us against ourselves. He'll take the smallest offense and create a mountain range with it so that we can stay in bondage. We have to be very mindful of his tricks and devices. Now, We've got to be able to recognize the enemy because the greatest accomplishment that Satan actually ever did is he actually convinced people that he doesn't exist. There's, there's about 57, I wish I could remember the stat, and I won't even try to quote it because I'm going to misquote it, but I remember reading that most people don't believe that Satan exists. And that's a masterful job, unfortunately, on the part of the enemy because even believers don't believe that they have a real enemy. They have a figment in their imagination of what the devil is, but they don't know that he's absolutely assaulting them 24-7 and will not stop until he is uh, bound and, and cast into the pit and eventually to the lake of fire. But until then, it's, it's war. It really is an invisible war. You know, <clears throat> you'll never hear this on the news. You know, I don't watch news, but you'll never hear this. And this is a little funny for me, so I'll try to, try to share it as I heard it. Today, Satan caused a massive explosion in the Middle East, or a Cat 5 hurricane is rushing towards the coast, or wherever it was stirred up by Satan. Back to you, Bill, in the studio. You're probably not going to have death, destruction, uh, bad weather events, none of that will ever be attributed to the Prince of Darkness. You're not going to hear that yet, and still he's behind it. He's behind sickness, disease, destruction, murders, war, but he never gets tagged. And so often, friends, God gets the one, God is the one who's responsible. We blame God. Well, why God, why? Um, you know, friends, God is not so responsible for everything that goes on our goes on this flaming rock of earth. He's just, he left us in charge. In some cases, as you can see, we're not doing a very good job. But I know one thing that God is, is in control of the heart of a true believer. God's in control of the heart of a true believer, a true believer, someone who loves him, someone who's filled with his presence. God is in control of that person. Amen. So here's a thought. Going back to Jesus, getting free, recognizing the enemy. If Jesus would pray, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, then why can't we look at people who, for whatever reason, have hurts, hang-ups, and say to them, Father, forgive my husband. Father, forgive my wife. Father, forgive my business partner. Father, forgive my brother. 
Father, forgive my boss. Father, forgive my sister. Father, forgive my teacher. If Jesus on the cross would say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, then, then what's our situation? Surely, as the Holy Spirit will empower us, we can do that. Thank you, Father. Now, remember that forgiveness does not make them right. It simply makes you free. It's been said that forgiveness is a poison that, unforgiveness is a poison that we drink thinking it's going to hurt the other person. The only person that gets hurt in unforgiveness is you. In fact, the person who hurt you probably, they're not even thinking about you. They have moved on. They're enjoying their day. They're all having a picnic. They're on vacation. They're doing anything, not even understanding that you're still hurt. So you need to get rid of that. Now, here's why you need to get rid of that, and we're going to pray some of that off. Unforgiveness causes a number of physical issues, back problems, arthritis, headaches, just to name a few. You know, what we have to remember is that sin causes sickness and not the other way around. So many times we forget that. So many sicknesses and diseases are caused because of unforgiveness, because of sin. Because something happened to you 25 years ago and you're still mad. Or he left and you hadn't quite gotten over it. Or you refuse to forgive. And what happens is it poisons your body. And believe me, friends, you need to get rid of that. And Jesus would want to make you free. Now here you know, here's what you need to know. Every problem and negative situation in our lives can always be traced back to sin. So forgive. Now We've all been told to forgive, and we've all been told to forgive ourselves, and I want to kind of undo that theology. You really can't forgive yourself. Oh, you need to forgive yourself. Oh, you need to forgive yourself. I've heard that. I've tried that. But only Jesus' blood applied to my sin committed, and the hurt that was caused by the sin that can be forgiven. Only the blood of Jesus can forgive sin. Only the blood of Jesus applied to my heart for the sins I committed can be cleansed and forgiven. We didn't spill our blood. We can't forgive ourselves because we didn't spill our blood. Jesus spilled his blood. Every situation, every ungodly act and sin that we've done can only be cleansed by Jesus. You know, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. So remember this. Jesus never forgives sin. He forgives people. Believe me, God was never happy about sin. Sin didn't have a chance. But God sent Jesus to die so that he could forgive the people. Amen. So, remember this. <clears throat> so, in praying, we should pray, I forgive myself. We should pray, Father, forgive me of the sins that I've committed against you. These same sins has caused me guilt and shame. Your word says that my sins are already forgiven. Please remove my guilt and shame of my sin in Jesus' name. Amen. So who would like to pray that? And I'll lead you through that. So let's get rid of some shame and some guilt and some sin. Repeat this. Say, Father, forgive me of the sins I have committed against you. These same sins have caused me guilt and shame. Your word says that my sins are already forgiven. Please remove my guilt and shame in the name of Jesus. Amen. Remember, sin, guilt, shame are three different things. It's kind of like taking out the trash, but the house still stinks. So when you're going through the process of forgiveness, make sure you're asking to be cleansed of your sin, your guilt, and your shame. Romans 8 1 says, There's therefore now no condemnation. So confess your sin and then get rid of the condemnation. Cast that off. God has not called us to condemnation. He's called us to freedom in Jesus' name. All right, here's another point. Do not treat the symptom, treat the cause. Getting to the root of the problem is the key. We have a tendency to slap a bandage on our pains as we suffer and off we go. Many Christians have become grace abusers. But God gives his grace so that we can maintain and stay in his love. Grace does not remove sin. I know that's a newsflash. Oh, God's grace, God's grace, God's grace. 
The blood of Jesus removes sin. We cannot claim grace to do what the blood of Jesus can only do. If grace removes sin, then the coming of Jesus was highly unnecessary. I mean, think about this. If you go back in Genesis, God showed grace to Noah. In Genesis 6, 9, it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And even in Abraham, in Genesis 18, 3, it says, My Lord, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass by your servant. So even before Jesus, God was showing grace. God has shown us grace all along. Ever since the fall of man of the man and woman, God has shown us grace. So keep in mind, let's not abuse grace. Let's understand that grace is to help us to stay in the love of God. And that grace does not remove sin. The blood of Jesus removes sin. Amen. So the point here is that grace cannot do what the blood did. In dealing with past hurts, we can't passively think or even pass the situation off on grace. We have to get to the root of the situation and apply the blood of Jesus. You know, one of my mentors and, and my actual ministry mentor, Joan Hunter, has a teaching that I love. And it has one that says that going, uh, teaching to go beyond forgiveness, uh, erasing the pain of your past. And, and, and a second one is called, um, hold on a second, bless me, Lord, getting rid of stress and trauma, both of which were teachings that were instrumental in helping me walk out of freedom. Because most people don't understand that they understand they're suffering from the sin, but they don't realize that it's the trauma that's at, that's at the, uh, the root, that's on the inside, that's at the memory cell level in their body that's keeping them stuck in, in sin and keeping them in bondage and also keeping them in sickness. So I want to encourage you, you know, you can go and log on and go to joanhunter.org and get the teachings on Erase the Pain of Your Past and um, the other one which is um, and just, and I lost it, so God bless me. Um, in the name of Jesus. Now today, we're talking about freedom. So the question is, do you really want to be free? Whatever you do, get free at all costs. God wanted me to be free of the junk, the hurt, and all the spiritual injuries, and he wants you to be free as well. So let's take a few minutes and let's diagnose the problem. Now because some of you don't think this applies to you. And if you don't think it applies to you, that lets me know that this does apply to you because the enemy's working the head job on us and it's called deception. So it's time to play spiritual doctor. So I'm going to be the spiritual doctor. So here we go. A person who is in bondage of any kind usually struggles for one or more of the following issues. And here's some of those issues that would lend you enough clues to know that you have bondages. There are quite a few, so here we go. Insecurity. If you suffer from insecurity, feeling of low self-esteem and inferiority, that's a good indicator that there may be bondages that you're suffering from. Jealousy and paranoia. If you have difficulty trusting people, you have trust issues. Let's say that again. If you have trust issues, that's a bondage. That's a stronghold. Defensiveness. People are always trying to prove themselves. Or they have a works mentality when it comes to ministry. They're always outdoing everybody. They're spending more time in the church. They're doing things. They're doing things. And yet they're defensive. That's an indicator that you would have a stronghold. Someone who walks around with a martyr mentality. It's kind of the me against the world. Every time you talk, every time they turn around and talking to you, and hopefully this is not you. You know, every, everything's against you. He said this, and she did, said that, and brother so-and-so said this, and sister so-and-so said that. That's a martyr's mentality. People who have self-pity. People who isolate themselves. Isolation is a number one indicator that I may be in bondage because the enemy loves to isolate. You know, it's kind of like watching one of those animal shows on Discovery Channel where you have the lions and the lions are chasing the herd of wildebeest. And actually when a pride of lions hunt, 
what they're looking for is the young or the weak. They're not actually, in most cases, going to attack the strongest because that means confrontations. The lions don't have they don't have a lot of endurance for long, long drawn out fights unless they gang up on you. Short story is this: if you watch a herd of wildebeest where they're being chased by a pack of lions, a pride of lions, excuse me. They'll migrate and they'll twist and they'll turn up and down through the valley. And what the lionesses are looking for, they're looking for the one that veers off to the left or veers to the right. At that point, the chase takes on a different turn. That's exactly what the enemy does to Christians. The enemy, you know, he seeks to, he's, the enemy ro roams around like a lion seeking who he may devour. That's a great analogy how the enemy tries to separate us from the pack and separate us from the herd. When the herd goes this way, but you go this way in isolationism, then you become a primary target. You have a chip on your shoulder. If you're argumentative and content, contentions, uh, contentious and you're always looking for a fight, anxiety, phobias, disorder, internal turmoil are always stirring. If you're pessimistic, you're always looking at the dark side. You never see the glass half and you ever see the glass half full, you see it halfway empty. Depression. If you're suffering from depression, you have a cloud of doom hanging over them. That's a great indicator that you have a stronghold. Loneliness and fear of intimacy. People who keep people at a distance have strongholds. God is an up-close God. God is a face-to-face -face God. God walked in the cool of the day with this man and his woman. God wants intimacy. When we have behaviors outside of God's pattern, those are indicators. Here's a few more. Victim mentality. It becomes their source of attention and identity, the excuse for failure and bad behavior. And people love to play the victim so they can get attention. That's a stronghold. Controlling and domineering. People who have the attitude, my way or the highway. Fear of failure. Fear of success. Someone who's aloof and cold. And denial. You know, people or individuals that say, you know what, everyone else has a problem. It's not me. Now, as I was saying earlier, we're diagnosing. So these are symptoms, not a problem. These are symptoms, not the root. The pain from hurt and fear and other rejection sets off a whole chain of, def of a defense mechanism. And when we're hurt, we start defending ourselves. That's a natural reaction. It's not the best reaction, but it is natural. So if you're defending your position, defending your situation, defending your words, defending your actions, step back and take a look at what it is that's hurting you. That will lead you to the root cause or the stronghold and the bondage that you're actually in. Hurt people hurt people. Jesus understood this and he understands that today. So God, just know that God is completely willing and able to set you free from every emotional bondage you face. But you have to allow him to help you pinpoint the root cause of your pain. He can only deliver you from the cause of the root and the tormenting symptoms that they have produced. That's what Jesus is interested in doing. Amen. So that's Another step in getting free. Here's step four of this five steps that I talked about. There's more. Here's another very, very important point on steps to get free and stay free. And that is release the power of love. Thank you, Jesus. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Once we get rid of the junk in our life, we must fill it up with love. Something has to fill the void. If love does not fill that void, guess what happened? The enemy will circle back around. I mean, Jesus said it perfectly in Matthew 45, 43. It says, now when an unclean spirit comes out of a man, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, and when it doesn't find it, it goes back to its home. When he gets there, he finds it swept, he finds it clean, he finds it unoccupied. Then he goes and finds seven other spirits like itself. And then the state of that man becomes worse than the first. So when you get free, if you take the challenge with the Holy Spirit and say, Father, I want to be free. And you allow a deep inner working of the Holy Spirit to root out and you repent of sin. At that point, we need to be filled with God's presence and God's spirit 
so that those places are occupied. The empty place must be filled with love. We must replace all the hate, the bitterness, with love, joy, and peace, and all of which comes through and by the Holy Spirit of God. We must pursue the ability to love unconditionally, and the only way you can get that is from God. God is the only person that can teach you about love is God. The only way you can learn about agape love is through the Word of God. No one is going to get there. There, there, there aren't any textbooks that's going to teach you. No one can teach you that the Holy Spirit will show you and help you walk and live love. Learning to walk in love is the greatest blessing you can receive from the Lord. To the point that the Father wants us to walk in so much love that it doesn't matter what the other person has done to us. Now that is love. And I'm not expecting any amens on that one. But God's goal is that he will help us to love like he loves. You know, the beginning of this year, it's what, you know, middle of the year, it's July almost. It is July. The Lord told me two things that he wanted for the church. And they're real simple words. He says, I want my church to give more and I want them to have godly character. And, you know, here it is, middle of the year, so it's kind of like time for a progress check. And I did that this week. I said, Lord, okay, Lord, how am I doing? And to the Holy Spirit's point, says, well, and he went on and told me some other things. So, yes, there's some things in my life. I'm like, okay, Lord, I need to do better at this. And, Lord, I need your help with this. And I'm not really doing so well at that. If you're not taking the time to give yourself a progress report, as my son gets, he gets a progress report, I believe it's every six weeks, how are you going to know how you're doing if you don't give yourself a report card? If you don't allow the Holy Spirit to share you, share with you and show you where you are, that's how you make progress. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 22, verses 37 and 40. And here's Jesus talking and to this passage is one of the strongest in, in the Gospels. And Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hallelujah that those are the only two that you really need to worry about keeping. Because those other 300 and some odd, no one's really kept those. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus kept them, but the rest of us, no. Keeping... These two commandments, you fulfill the law. Notice that it says, there aren't any thou shalt not. It says, you shall love God. And it says, you shall love your neighbor. So God is exhorting us to do something. He's not telling us what not to do. He's telling us what to do. Love God, love your neighbors, and then we'll fulfill all the whole law and the prophets. Now, as believers and members of God's family, God is most concerned about how we treat other people. It's interesting because sometimes believers treat unbelievers better than we treat other believers. And the reason why we treat unbelievers better than we treat other believers is because we expect unbelievers to not act right. So we give them a pass. We say in our hearts or within ourselves, well, they're not saved. That's why they have bad behavior. Whereas when we have a believer, a brother or sister in the faith, we cut them no slack. We're judgmental. We're critical. We condemn them. We cast them down. We backbite. We murmur. We complain. We basically push them out in front of a moving train, and we don't think anything about that. That grieves the heart of God. And brother, that brother, sister, beloved, if that's you, we, we're just going to pray that off right now. We are pray teaching, so let's just pray that off. Father, in the name of Jesus, pray this. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I have been critical. I have said things. I have done things, I have said things in my heart, verbal, non-verbally, and done things that are not pleasing to you, that have been harmful to others. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for being critical, for being judgmental, and for backbiting and gossiping and hurting and talking about your children whom you love dearly. Forgive me of my sins, cleanse me from unrighteousness, and give me a clean mouth and put a guard on my mouth that I may speak your word aright. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's good. That's not fun. And you're not going to have that preached on a Sunday morning. But the truth is, that needs to happen more often. You know, it's not so much what we say. It's sometimes what we don't say. And it's those uncertain, unseen words that we say. Thank you, Jesus. 
We, as I was saying earlier, we attack our own so many times, but we have to remember Jesus never condemned anyone. You know, we all know and love John 3.16, but if we keep reading, John 3.17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, to reject or condemn or to pass sentence. But he sent his Son into the world that the world might be made safe and saved through him. So Jesus didn't even come to condemn the world. So if Jesus is not going to condemn, we shouldn't either. So Jesus, help us to take and do exactly what you did. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, verse 30. Let's keep on this thread of not judging because this is good because this is back to what are some issues that keep us bound. It says, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 28, verse 30, but let a man examine him help himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Here's what that means. Many people are sick because of how they treat the body of Christ. They run people down. They talk about their pastors. I have done it, and so have you. People talked about Jesus. And if they'll talk about Jesus, that means the rest of us are just easy targets. Know this, saints, that not walking in love is a sin and causes spiritual death. You can read all about that in Romans chapter 1, verses 29 through 32. I call it the death list. And believe me, there's nothing lovely about that list. 1 John 4, 20, 21. It says, if anyone says, I love God and hates to test his brother, he is a liar who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. So if we don't love our brothers, how in the world can we say we love God? And this command, charge, order, and judgment we have heard from him, that he who loved God shall love his brother and love believers also. You know, when we talk about other saints, pastors, teachers, and leaders, we actually are word cursing them. We're actually persecuting Jesus. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, as you remember, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And this is in Acts 9, 4 and 5. When we heard of the people were actually persecuting Jesus, we're hurting God. So beloved, in the name of Jesus, and I say this nicely, shut up in the name of Jesus. We need to be quiet because not walking in love is actually satanic. It's actually, it's satanic. I mean, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So get this, the accuser of the brethren, and his job is to point the finger at God's people and stir up strife among, among them. And how does he do that? Through gossip and slander. So let's not act like Satan. Let's not have his behavior. Let's not have his characteristic. Because it does say, God says, I mean, these are the things that God hate. And if you want to get on God's bad side, even as a believer, God still hates this. Proverbs 6, 16 19, these 16 the Lord hates, seven are abomination, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, the heart that manufactures wicked thoughts and plans, feet that are swift to run into evil, bearing a false witness, people who breathes out lies, one who lies under an oath, and one who sows discord among the brethren. These are the things that God are telling us believers, we are not to have these ungodly behaviors. We are to not take on the characteristics of Satan. We are to love God and love as a witness. Turn your Bibles to John 13, 35. Here's Jesus talking. He says, and by this all men shall know you are my disciple. If you love one another, you will be my disciples. That's how they know us. They know us by the few. There are millions of believers who say that they are Christians, but there are very few disciples. Be a disciple. Disciples not only read the Bible, but they do the Bible in the name of Jesus. So let's throw another prayer here. We're pray teaching. Here's a prayer, and I'm going to feed you the words, and you pray it because, again, we're getting free. And this is to help you to walk in love and release, release your brothers and sisters. Say, Father, I have said words that did not edify, exhort, correct, in love, or confirm. I repent of those words and I renounce them in the name of Jesus. I ask you to bless anyone 
and everyone that I have spoken ill words over. And likewise, based on my repentance, any words that have been spoken over me that did not edify, exhort, correct in love, or confirm are broken off now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's not easy to do, beloved. Because you have spoken words. I have spoken words that did not edify, exhort, or comfort. And those words have been spoken over you. So we break those words off today in the name of Jesus. Now here's what we need to do to stay focused and being free and staying free. And this requires work. And I know work is another one of those words that is a little dirty when we say it. But not work as in physical work, but the work of your heart. Colossians 3, verses 2 through 3. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For you died, for your life is hidden with Christ and God. The best practice I know to do in the way I explain this is that when nothing is going right, begin to think about how good he is and to begin to tell him how great he is regardless of how you feel. It works every time. If you want to keep your mind focused, say what God says. Say, say what the word says despite, regardless of how you feel. The other thing that we need to do as believers to stay in God's love is align our words with God's word. Exchange your negative word for positive words. Amen. Here's a question. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to exchange your words, your negative words for, for positive words? Because in the spirit realm, when we release our words, they're either negatively charging our atmosphere and empowering the demons or the angels which hearken to the voice of the, the word of God are working on our behalf. Now keep in mind too, we have to align our words with God's word because we have two forces that are work in the earth. Two of them. We have the angels of the living God and we have the demonic spirits. Both are legalistic. The angels of God hearken to the voice of his words. Demons hearken to everything else. God is merciful. Jesus is merciful. Holy Spirit is merciful. Angels and demons are not merciful. They don't have emotion. They're legalistic. They only take the words we speak that are either in alignment with God's word or that are not in alignment. They only act on those words, either the word of God or any inoperative, non-beneficial words. So when we spot off negative words, God listens with a merciful heart whether we are right or wrong because God's merciful. But, you know, just because we're hurting doesn't mean that God moves. God moves by faith. And then if we are uh, not lining our words up with God's word, his servants won't move a finger. Remember that death and life are in the power of the tongue. We are snared by what? The words of our mouth. And then, as the word says, he who guards his mouth preserves his life. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. So getting free and staying free, maintaining freedom, happens right here with your mouth. Once you've cast off, once you've prayed off, once you have repented, and the fruits of righteousness are being established in your heart by way of the Holy Spirit, you maintain that. By confessing and keeping your mouth in alignment. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to have a crazy thought or a feeling or you may have a thought, I'm not sure if that person, if I even forgave that person. That's normal. But the way you maintain your freedom is by aligning your words with what the Word of God says. You know, James says that our tongue is such a little member. And it, 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 I mean, it, it can set the whole world on fire. So we do have to be extremely mindful of what it is that we say and do and maintain freedom. So let's pray one more prayer before we close. And this is a prayer to actually tame our tongue. And you know, this is something that you need to do, but let's get started. Let's ask and let's pray the right prayer. So Father, in the name of Jesus, say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, according to your word, to help me to tame my tongue. 
Father, the book of James says that the tongue is a ruly evil, full of poison. And Father, I don't want my tongue to be unruly and full of poison. In the name of Jesus, I put my tongue and my words on your altar. I ask you, Father, to put a guard on my lips that I may speak the word of truth. And Father, any negative word or any inoperative word that I have spoken, I curse those words at the root. I command those words in the heavenly to be ineffective and to be void. I thank you, Father, that I'm free from all the negative words that I have spoken over myself. And I thank you, Father God, that the Holy Spirit will guide me into the truth and help me to praise you with my mouth. I declare this, I believe this, and receive this in the name of Jesus. Amen.